Hello and welcome to episode one of Christ Revealed. I am filled with excitement right now. Why? Because I know the journey that we're getting ready to go on. Traveling across the United States, talking to the Christian apologetic community, taking a film crew to Israel and traveling throughout the entire country, looking at the most important sites in the Holy Land. I can't tell you the scope, the breadth of this is beyond anything you can possibly imagine, and I'm so excited to share it with you right now. Christ revealed the history, the evidence, the inspiration. We're looking at all three of those dimensions throughout this series. We were able to sit with people in locations that are unimaginable to bring information and inspiration in a way like you've never seen it before. One thing I really want to encourage you to do is to share this. We're going right now into our free viewing period. Have other people come check this out. It is an experience that is life changing. And I can say that with full confidence because in creating this project, it changed my life and it changed the lives of other people who were involved in it also. A lot of unexpected things happened. A lot of revelations occurred. I can't wait for you to see what it's all about. So please do share it with other people you know. Also know that if you want to own Christ Revealed, that's available for you too. But right now, I just want to get into episode one with you. So here we go. Episode one of our nine part docuseries, Christ Revealed, for you. The world of Christian apologetics is fascinating, stimulating, intellectually moving, and it also touches you in your heart. In this interview with Sean McDowell, who's in the Christian apologetic community, son of most people would know in the Christian community, Josh McDowell, we have a conversation that I found to be riveting, logical, and inspiring. Sean teaches Christian students and takes them places like to atheist groups, to Muslim groups, to discuss and interact and talk about their different views, different values, to sharpen their minds and hearts in the faith that they have. Sean McDowell, I believe, is powerfully intellectually, very compelling in his arguments and understanding of Christianity and the Christian faith, and somebody I'm really excited to introduce you to. So let's jump in and enjoy my interview with Sean McDowell. Sean, thanks so much for uh, spending time with us here today, and I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Oh, happy to do it. This is a great project. Can you uh, give us a little bit of your background? Sure, be happy to. I'm a professor at Biola University, teaching a graduate program in apologetics, which is just offering a defense for what we believe and why we believe it. I also teach high school part-time. I taught high school full-time for 10 years before pursuing a doctorate, and I love working with students, uh, working with young people. So I teach part-time at a Christian high school, and then I get to speak to students and write, and I'm a father and a husband. Wow. So uh, you have your PhD in what subject? I got a doctorate in apologetics and worldview studies. Wow. So explain what that is when they would say well, apologetics. Well, go ahead and explain that, but also what you mean by worldview studies. Sure. Yeah, we had somebody call up to Biola University and say, why do you have classes on apologetics? Why are you apologizing for the faith? Right. Well, of course, that's a misunderstanding what apologetics is. First Peter 3.15 says, set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. Always be ready with an answer or a reason for the hope within. Give it with gentleness and with respect. Well, the word translated into English, answer or reason, comes from the Greek apologia, uh -huh. so it's apologetics. So apologetics, especially in the Greek context at that time, meant given a defense or reason for what you believe. So when Plato wrote a defense of Socrates, he called it an apology. Right. So apologetics, we have classes on why does God allow evil, classes on intelligent design, right. classes, I teach one on the resurrection or how we know the scriptures are true. And then worldview studies was a little broader that would include cultural issues, philosophy, and just how to apply it to certain issues of the day. That's great. Tell me what you think was meant by the hope within. What I think Peter meant is that as believers, we don't grieve uh, without hope. We don't live in a purposeless, just immaterial world. There's a God who's created us and who's conquered death and evil through the resurrection. And for those of us who believe in him, regardless of the pain and the hurt we see around us, 
we always have hope that a better day is coming. And how critical hope is. And this ties into, because one of the things that I, I feel like through this process I'm discovering um, is that faith, I think, is an additional human need. Mm -hmm. You're just given the predicament of being a human being, trying to be one without faith, uh, I think, leaves a, a big void that can lead to all kinds of problems. So do you think those two things are tied together? Well, I do. I mean, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And he mm -hmm. said, love God. And he said, love other people. Mm -hmm. So we have been made to be in relationship with God and to be in relationship with other people. Now, to be in relationship with God, that requires faith. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not blind faith. Right. That's not believing something without evidence. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think faith is trusting what we have reason to believe is true. Right. But it goes beyond what we can see. It involves a hope in future things such as heaven. Mm -hmm. So we have good reason to believe in those things and we trust God. And that's really what gives us hope in the present. So uh, when you are in uh, classes teaching uh, in the apologetics classes, mm -hmm. Um, what are some of the responses you get from students who are coming in to learn in that environment? Are they, um, are they surprised by the, the, the level of uh, you know, intellectual prowess that's attached to all of this? So we have a very unique program mm -hmm. in that it's a graduate program and it's a master's level. So mm -hmm. we have people from 25 years old to 75 years old who come in distinctly wanting to study and learn about the evidence. Right. So by the time they get into my class, they are sold on the fact that there is evidence, there's facts, they right. believe it. Really what I find is when I go speak at churches, when I speak on college campuses, there's people who the first time hear about evidence for the resurrection. They hear about evidence from the origin of the universe pointing towards a beginner. They hear about philosophical evidence mm -hmm. from a moral law that we know to a moral lawgiver, namely God. Mm -hmm. So I think the church and the broader culture is pleasantly surprised and intrigued and interested when they're introduced to some of the evidence for God in general and Christianity in particular. So in, in the general framework of philosophy and, and its branches, morality being one of them, uh, you know, the, the, most people do not say that you know, or would not consider that there's a Christian uh, view relative to this, that's a, you know, that's a well-reasoned view. They almost think like, well, you, know, you have to separate yourself from philosophy in order to uh, you know, be a Christian or to think like a Christian, but uh, it seems like the opposite is true. Well, I think that's the case. We live in a world that says there's truth when it comes to science, there's truth in history, mm -hmm. there's truth in mathematics, but when it comes to religion, it's all a matter of opinion. It's a matter of feeling. Whatever you believe is true for you. Mm -hmm. So without even realizing it, even amongst many believers and non-believers, there's kind of this divorce between facts and evidence and your religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. What makes Christianity unique is in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, if Jesus is not risen, our faith is in vain. Mm -hmm. It's worthless. We're still in our sins. In fact, we're to be pitied. So our faith is tied to a single, testable, historical event. So Jesus did rise, Christianity's true. If he didn't, it's false. So I think for people to start to make that connection and realize that facts matter, mm -hmm. evidence matters, and we should use our minds when it comes to faith, that's eye-opening and encouraging for many people, challenging for others. So over 2,000 years later, are we uh, able to establish some facts that are, uh, that are rational? I think so. In fact, what's interesting is we would tend to think the further we get away from the time of Christ, the less confidence we can have in the evidence. That would kind of be the natural intuition. Right. I think it's the opposite. I think with increased technology, with increased discipline today, we are actually able to, able to get closer to the very words of Jesus, confidence in the scripture. Mm -hmm. We're able to uncover certain archeological finds we were not aware of in the past. So I actually think the evidence is increasing the further we move away from the events from which Jesus actually lived. So, and we, we see that, as you said, there, there is uh, you know, archeological evidence that exists and you know, we're really excited to be going to uh, Israel to start looking at some of this and interviewing these people. It's gonna be great. Has there been any contradictory evidence that's come up? So it depends on what you mean by contradictory evidence. I think there's some evidence that's incomplete, mm -hmm. evidence that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the issue, take the topic of archeology, span most places in the Bible have not been found. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not to prove they don't exist. That's because most places have not even been excavated in Israel. It's like right. less than 1%. Right. 
for a lot of political reasons and other reasons. But then of the sites that have been excavated, not 100% of those sites of that individual site has been excavated. It's a minority of that site. Mm -hmm. But then of the small amount of sites that have been excavated, very few of those have been studied, conclusions have been drawn, and then released to the public. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have this expectation that if anything happened, we'd be able to find it very easily, but there's political, there's historical, there's all these professional kind of just factors in the way. So I would say as a whole, what we found broadly supports the Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. But even in like a court of law, when you have a case, there's always some facts you're just trying to figure out where they fit, even though the broad case might be enough to convict somebody beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. So, uh, and it's interesting. I didn't realize that you know, less than one percent of it is, you know, has been, uh, you know, the archaeological digs account for less than one percent, and that there's much more they could be doing. But you think there's barriers in the way of, of uh, doing that work? Oh, sure. Some of the barriers can be finances, mm -hmm. the money to do it. Some can be safety issues. Mm -hmm. Barriers can be legal issues, political issues personal issues in Israel. If somebody has a home on top of a site, right. they have vested interest in not losing their home. Right. So there's just a lot of factors that come into play with our ability to excavate particular areas. And sometimes there's uncertainty where exact, exactly cities were, exactly where mountains were. And this is just because we're thousands of years removed from the events. These are the kinds of things we would expect mm -hmm. dealing with events from antiquity. But yet, in your lifetime, there have been discoveries that have been, you know, corroborating, uh, you know, in nature as far as what what the discovery was and what was said in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is there any that stand out to you? Uh, there's a number that have been found. One was actually shortly before my lifetime, but one of one of my favorites was. Years ago in the Harvard Theological Review, there was a professor who wrote and said, there's astonishingly little evidence that the feet of a crucified person was ever pierced by nails. Right. So all of the crucified victims that we found had been crucified with ropes. Right. That seemed to contradict the biblical account, especially in John, when Thomas says, I want to see the nail marks in your hands and in your feet. So does the Bible contradict the archaeological record? Well, 1967, about a decade before I was born, mm -hmm. a man who's been named Yehohanan was found in the middle of the first century in Palestine, and he was crucified in the way that is described happened to Jesus. Mm. Now, there's still some scholarly debate whether or not his, his legs were actually broken, as it describes in, in John chapter 19. Mm -hmm. So that's unconfirmed, but nails were used that shows John accurately described the way crucifixion took place in that place and at that time. So to me, as the archaeological record continues, we, we just kind of come across these findings that slowly corroborate the biblical story. And with that, an area of focus for you has been the fate of the apostles. Mm -hmm. So uh, why did you decide to write on that, and why did that become an area of focus for you? Yeah, that's a great question. I... I grew up hearing apologetics in a defense of the faith, and one of them was that all the apostles, except probably John, died these grisly deaths because they refused to recant their belief that they'd seen the risen Jesus. Right. Therefore, it's true. And there's a power to that. Why would somebody intentionally die for something that was false? Mm -hmm. Well, a few years ago, I was taking a group of students up to Berkeley where we invited in some skeptics to speak to our Christian students. And mm -hmm. I teach my students how to ask good questions and just interact with people with very different belief systems. So, okay, just th that's fascinating. So you basically <laughs> say, I'm going to take these students yeah. who you know, we're, we're trying to, they've come here with an agenda to learn and mm -hmm. you know, we want to shape them. And one of your methodologies in doing that is to put them in front of some skeptics and, yeah, and these, let them, so you're not afraid of, uh, of the other side of the, of the argument. No, these are high school students. In fact, we've right. had students down to 12 and 13 oh, years wow. old so go with us. Wow, okay. We'll bring in leading atheists, leading skeptics, leading people from very different worldviews. Now we train our students very carefully mm -hmm. and we go with them and we debrief afterwards, but I, I'm not afraid to expose my students to contrary ideas. I think that's just awesome. got to train them well. Yeah, they usually walk away more confident once they've seen the pushback, and then we make sense of it. So we're on this trip, and I had a friend of mine who was arguing. He's what you might call a mythicist. Argues Jesus didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. And one of our students said, "Well, why would all the apostles die if Jesus didn't exist?" And he pushes back. He goes, "Give me evidence that any of them actually died." And this was about seven or eight years ago. My students all look at me like I'm supposed to have the answer. And I sat there and I thought, 
I don't really know. Mm -hmm. I've just taken it second, third hand from other people. I've never looked into this myself. And I was in a doctoral program looking for a doctoral thesis topic. <laughs> so it hit me that night. I'm like, this is perfect. I have to know for myself mm -hmm. if this is really a good argument. And I imagine other people are going to be pretty interested too. So that night, I pretty much decided I was going to start writing on that if my committee would approve it. So uh, what was that journey like once you started uh, making that your doctoral thesis? Well, when you write a doctoral thesis, I had to be careful not to start off and say, I want to prove that they all died as martyrs mm -hmm. to make this argument. There's a temptation to that, and I had to consistently fight back on that because that's the only way to be scholarly objective and be fair to the evidence mm -hmm. and really ask, is this a good argument? Mm -hmm. What's the evidence they died as martyrs? Can we really believe they were eyewitnesses of Jesus? Mm -hmm. And if this is true, what's the best way to make the argument? Mm -hmm. So it began by just kind of mentally shifting rather than just making an apologetic, mm -hmm. really asking the question, as fairly as I could. And I told my wife, I'm like, I've got to be willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads. Right. Is this a good argument? Mm -hmm. So I just started, I, I mean, I literally started by Googling just to see what right. people were saying. Right. Didn't get much out of that. Right. Then I started doing journal researches. I looked at books. I called scholars. I mean, you just become a detective right. and you trace every single you know footnote you can until you feel like you've exhausted the evidence that's out there. And then you try to assess it as fairly as you can. And where did it lead you? What were some of the highlights? Well, some of the highlights, I would say basically, I decided to study the, the 12 apostles with Matthias instead of Judas, mm -hmm. and then James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, mm -hmm. because they're such significant figures in the early church, and they're both eyewitnesses of Jesus, and both not believers in Jesus mm -hmm. during their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I think we can conclude with confidence that at least James, the brother of Jesus, James, the son of Zebedee, Peter, and Paul, we have good historical evidence mm -hmm. that they died as martyrs. Mm -hmm. I think a decent case can be made for uh, Thomas mm -hmm. and for Andrew. I think the rest, to be honest with you, it's hard to know when history ends and when legend begins. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. For example, the story is that Bartholomew was skinned alive. This is the tradition we often hear. Well, the earliest record that I could find is about 500 AD. Mm. Now that doesn't mean it's false, but historically speaking, we can't have much confidence in that being true. Not to mention when it comes to Bartholomew, there's a number of different traditions about where he went and how he died, about five, six, seven different traditions. Right. So I'm looking at this saying, I don't think historically speaking, we can have a lot of confidence that Bartholomew died that way. Right. So when I ratcheted it back, I said, okay, what really matters here? I said, well, the first thing is we have good, early, consistent evidence that the apostles were eyewitnesses of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's why they believed. We see it in all four gospels. We see this distinctly in Paul's writings, like 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Mm -hmm. We see it in extra biblical writings, church fathers like Clement of Rome and Ignatius talking about that. So very early, the consistent record is the apostles saw mm -hmm. with their own eyes. Right. Second, we know at the heart of their faith was the resurrection. Mm -hmm. There is no early Christian faith apart from belief in the resurrection. There's some critics who will say, in the second century, you know, this resurrection begins to emerge, but it wasn't at the heart. Well, this just simply isn't true. Mm -hmm. The earliest account we have in 1 Corinthians 15, which is at least two decades after the death of Jesus, and I think he's passing on a creed that he received earlier, mm -hmm. probably within three to five years of the death of Jesus. Paul says, I pass on you what was most important, mm -hmm. that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose on the third day. The early consistent testimony is that to be a Christian mm -hmm. was to believe in the resurrection. I mean, read the book of Acts when they mm -hmm. start proclaiming and preaching the, the message of Jesus, it's about the resurrection. So the gospels are eyewitnesses. Second, we know that they were proclaiming the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Third, we see persecution. I decided to read through the New Testament and pay attention to every single book when either somebody was persecuted mm -hmm. or Jesus taught that someone would be persecuted for their faith. Mm -hmm. I was stunned and partly disappointed how much I had missed this before. Mm -hmm. At the heart of Jesus' message is pick up your cross mm -hmm. and follow me. Right. Now, sometimes we say, pick up your cross. My neighbor listens to loud music. My son is disobedient. Well, that's not what he meant. Yeah. He meant pick up your cross, 
and be ready to die. Mm. It's over Paul's right, it's over James' right, it's in Hebrew, this consistent message, you proclaim Jesus, persecution is coming. Mm -hmm. But then we see this outside of the church in writings like Tacitus and in Pliny the Younger that when people proclaim the message of Jesus publicly, they were persecuted. So if we take a step back, what does this tell us? You have a group of people who believe they had seen the risen Jesus, the first thing they proclaim is the resurrection. We have reason to believe that if people were proclaiming the resurrection, persecution was very likely. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the individual apostles, what do we find? We find some good evidence for Peter. First century evidence that he died as a martyr. Same for Paul. And I think same for both James. Mm -hmm. So the key is not so much that we can show that all of the apostles died as martyrs. The key is that they sincerely believe that Jesus was risen from the grave mm -hmm. and were willing to suffer and die. And we That's just, the key. And it's compelling. I mean, it's not like um, a leap of logic that if you can pretty much corroborate that, you know, that at least a handful of them you know, you can see they were, they did die as martyrs, mm -hmm. then it's not unreasonable to suggest that the other ones could have also. Yeah, I, th I think the key is to, to argue this. Mm -hmm. You look in the book of Acts, chapter four and five, the apostles start proclaiming the risen Jesus. Right. They're threatened, they're beaten, they're thrown in prison. We see Stephen killed in mm -hmm. the early chapters of Acts. We see James killed in Acts 12 too. And they're told, just stop proclaiming the risen Jesus. Mm -hmm. In Acts 5, Paul basically says we can't. We fear God more than we fear men. Mm -hmm. So the earliest record we have is this group of men proclaiming they'd seen the risen Jesus, willing to suffer and die and face persecution for that belief. Mm -hmm. We have no record any of them recanted, mm -hmm. and we know with confidence that at least some of them died as martyrs. Right. So this doesn't prove the resurrection is true, but it tells us they didn't make it up. They yep. were sincere. Yep. They didn't invent this false story to get themselves persecuted and to lose everything. They really believed Jesus had risen from the grave and appeared to them. So with that now, it's a great area of focus to, you know, to say, let's go deep here and see what does exist in the way of information around this and evidence. What other things about the resurrection have you, like, do you feel like is very compelling as far as saying that the resurrection is validated? Well, I think we have to go step by step and look at the facts that we know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people start and say, we've got to de defend the entire Bible being true, and then you get the resurrection thrown in. Right. Well, I think we can make a case from archaeology, from manuscripts, etc., that the Bible and the New Testament and the Gospels are reliable documents. Mm -hmm. But we can also say, let's just look at this event, the resurrection, through the lens of how we would look at any event in history, mm -hmm. see what facts we know are true, and ask what conclusion best explains it. So there's a few things we know. Did Jesus die? Well, that's unmistakable. We have medical evidence that blood and water came out that John reports, which only happened we can medically show at the point of death. We have it multiple attestation in all the gospels, the writings of Paul, writings of Peter. Uh, we even have Josephus and Tacitus, extra biblical writers talking about Jesus dying. Mm -hmm. So Jesus died on the cross. But then we have this amazing evidence for an empty tomb. One piece of fact being that it was discovered by women. Mm -hmm. I find this very fascinating. If you're the apostles and you're making up in that culture a story based on a resurrection in which a woman's testimony was not valued as highly as a man's testimony. Mm -hmm. In fact, the more significant an event was, the less likely they would rely upon a woman. So you're the apostles and you're inventing a story mm -hmm. based upon a historical event, who's the least likely people you'd invent? Well, it's obvious, women. Right. So why do they all report, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that women found the tomb? Because that's what they really believed happened. They weren't inventing this story. Mm -hmm. Then you have all these cases of appearances. You have mm -hmm. appearances to the 500 in 1 Corinthians 15. You have appearances to the apostles. You have appearances again to the women. You have appearances to skeptics like Thomas, uh, James, and Paul, and then you have this transformation of the apostles, willing to suffer and die for this, tells me they didn't make this up. We have good, consistent, early evidence that Jesus rose from the grave. Now other people might say, okay, here's other theories that can explain the resurrection. Right. And you just Google this, you'll find endless hypotheses. But the question always has to be, 
given certain facts that we know, what theory best explains all of them right. and has the least problems? So probably the most common one is that, that the apostles hallucinated. Mm -hmm. well, one big problem with that is hallucinations are internal subjective feelings. Right. There's not an external object that matches up with them. Well, we have multiple accounts of group appearances of Jesus. I mean, you can no more share a hallucination than you can a dream. Right. So hallucinations have a hard time accounting for the facts. It also can't really account for the empty tomb. Mm -hmm. Another common one, which really rocked me in high school, I grew up in a Christian home, and I heard that the Bible is true. I always believed it. And then I heard these skeptics who wrote these articles that said, maybe Jesus didn't exist. Maybe Christianity is patterned after these dying and rising gods, Mithras mm -hmm. and Horus and Adonis and Isis from you know, kind of the ancient world at that time. And it's, there's nothing unique about Christianity. I'd never heard that before. Mm -hmm. And it rocked me intellectually and emotionally to think, what if the story isn't true? When I started to look into it, I realized that there's a few huge problems with this. Number one, the dating is all wrong. Mm -hmm. So some of these stories existed before the time of Christ, but any of the parts of the stories that closely mirror Christianity tend to come from the second, third, and fourth centuries. Mm. So if there's any borrowing going on, it's from them borrowing from Christianity rather than the other way around. Second, you'll see similar terms, but what they mean by these terms are very different. So last time I looked, it's been a little while, on Wikipedia, it said that Osiris resurrected. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like Jesus resurrected, Osiris resurrected. Well, if you read the story of Osiris, he's murdered, thrown into a chest, falls in the bottom of the sea, body is put back together, mm -hmm. and eventually becomes God of the underworld. That's not a resurrection. Mm -hmm. It's the same word, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have the same meaning. Mm -hmm. Besides, these are fictional stories that are patterned after the dying and rising of the seasons, not historical events like we have with the person of Jesus. There's many other naturalistic hypotheses that people put in, but none of them can account for the facts that we know with as much consistency and power as the resurrection. So what do you think right now for, is, the, is the biggest or some of the bigger misconceptions about Christianity that non-Christians or the non-Christian world has a certain view of Christianity from the outside, looking from the outside in as compared to from the inside out? What do you think is some of the mischaracterizations that, uh, that are erroneous? I, I think of a few. I think, number one, people look at and say, well, look at all the bloodshed and the horror and atrocities done in the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's a common misconception. Now, certainly some bad things have been done by people who say that they are believers and by the church. I'm not denying that, but that's the lens by which people see all of Christianity. Mm -hmm. They miss, number one, all the good that's been done in the name of Christ, hospitals, universities, orphanages, women rights, etc. Mm -hmm. And people also fail to distinguish between when people do things that goes against what Jesus taught, mm -hmm. Clearly, they're violating the way Jesus told people to live. So I think I do think a lot of people look at Christianity through that lens, which I don't think is the whole picture. Mm -hmm. I think another one, people look at Christianity and just think, as with any religion, it's all a matter of faith. Mm -hmm. It's just blind faith. Mm -hmm. Just believe it if it works for you. And they don't realize that Christianity is based upon a testable historical event. Mm -hmm. I think the other one is... A first question in many people's minds today is not so much, is Christianity true, mm -hmm. but is Christianity good? Mm -hmm. I think we live in a culture given certain moral norms that have been broadly accepted, in particular related to the issue of sexuality. Mm -hmm. Christians are bigoted, they're hateful, they're intolerant. Mm -hmm. So many people won't even consider the evidence because they look at Christians, or at least the perception of Christians that's proclaimed to them. And they think, why would I want to be like that so they don't even entertain the evidence? Right. Those are three big pushbacks that I tend to see. And do you feel like they many times are building straw men? Yeah, you know, there's a bad apple you know, who's proclaimed to be a Christian but doesn't practice the, the moral code of Christianity, if you will, but then say, you know, they're, they're held out as the poster child in the media as a straw man basically to discredit Christianity. I do think that happens. A few years ago, I, I wrote this book answering some of the big objections that the new atheists at this time were raising against Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I called up one of the largest skeptical groups where I live in Southern California, and I said, hey, 
I'd be willing to come to your group. I'll give you all a free book and just sit in the hot seat and you can ask me whatever questions you'd like to ask a Christian. I'm not gonna pretend to have all the answers, right. but maybe we could have a conversation. So I went up there with my pastor and my wife in this home, there were about 20 skeptics, atheists, agnostics that were there, and we had a wonderful conversation. And one thing that stood out to me was how many misconceptions they had about Christians because right. of a TV show that they saw because of a comment they heard, because of a classmate. These isolated individual experiences shaped how they saw all of Christians. Mm -hmm. And one reason was a lot of them didn't know a Christian. Now in fairness, Christians can do the same thing to other groups. Mm -hmm. They maybe don't know a Muslim, maybe don't know an atheist. Mm -hmm. So they have a misconception and see them entirely through that lens. Right. So that's why it's important whoever's watching this to say, you know what, let's ask, is my perception of this group, whoever it is accurate? Do I know people in this group? So I take the time to listen to them and accurately understand what they believe and why they believe it. So I think you're absolutely right. A lot of people reject a straw man of Christianity, mm -hmm. not what Christianity really believes and what Jesus really taught. Now this is fascinating to me because I think that is a misconception in and of itself. You, you've now mentioned it twice with your students and now with yourself saying that there's a local group of atheists. And I don't think most people would say, well, you know, listen, I'm a Christian, I teach in this arena, let's have a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, most people would say, I don't want to know those people, or they feel like there'd be some mm -hmm. kind of a condescending judgment against, you know, uh, these people who are non-Christians and, and maybe even are, are trying to uh, discredit Christianity. But instead, you want to show up and actually have the conversation. What was their disposition towards you? You know what? When I sat down and it started, mm -hmm. the head of the group who's become a friend of mine, he looked at me and he goes, kudos to you. Uh -huh. And I said, why? He goes, I can't believe you'd have the guts to just come and sit here in our group and be a part of this. Mm -hmm. Not many Christians would do this. Mm -hmm. Now, sadly, he's right. And I didn't, I'm not saying that to give myself a pat on the back, but most people are not willing to step outside of their comfort zone mm -hmm. to meet people. It's easier to label. It's easier to throw bombs on social media from a distance. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to preach in a mosque mm, wow. about four weeks ago. And the Imam and I had a conversation. We disagreed, but it was cordial. He was so gracious. They served the best food, <laughs> Middle Eastern food you could imagine. Right. And we accomplished, we clarified. I think most people today, if you treat them with respect and you see them in person, not just online, are willing to have conversations about faith. I really do. So this is, uh, I'm startled uh, here, uh, pleasantly startled. So you go from having a interaction with a group of atheists to now preaching in a mosque. Can you, can you give us a little more detail on that experience, what that was like to walk in there and do this? Well, this was a unique experience. I was working with a group in the inner city in Philadelphia, and we were taking students out to have conversations with people in the city, right. just with very different beliefs. And I knew I was taking a group of students into a mosque. And in the morning when we were debriefing to get ready, the fellow on our side who's leading it, he says, and you'll be preaching for 15 minutes in a mosque, sharing the Christian view of salvation. I said, okay, time out. <laughs> I didn't get that memo. Like, I'm happy to do it, that's awesome, but I need to know, like, what are they expecting? How long do I have? What do you mean present the Christian view of salvation? So I prepared that day, I went in, and I was asked to give my, there's probably 150 of our students, maybe 100 and 150 Muslims from the mosque, mm -hmm in an open room and they had food in the back and I was allowed to present the Christian view of salvation 15 minutes. The Imam presented the Muslim view of salvation 15 minutes and then we sat there and took questions back and forth. And I'll tell you, this Imam was so gracious. He was kind, he was warm, so hospitable. We differed, so he didn't pretend we didn't differ, but I walked away, I mean, our students loved it. Right. And I walked away going, wow. And I think a lot of people, not everybody, there's some people out there that wouldn't, but there's a lot of people, if you just step outside of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. treat them the way you'd want to be treated, would be willing to have spiritual conversations. And the best part is I realized some of our students had faulty views about Islam. Right. And based on many of their questions, I realized so many of them didn't even understand the gospel. Wow. They didn't get it. They had a straw man view of it. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't heard that any of them became Christians, but at least they understand more clearly right. who Jesus claimed to be, what it means to be a Christian, and I think they felt loved by Christians. If, if you watch the news and world political events, you would think that that was what you just described is an impossibility and that mm -hmm. there is no way for there to be 
conversation, communication, a shared spiritual experience, um, and, uh, and which creates understanding. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean alignment that suddenly you know, people's minds are changed about their faith, sure. but it creates understanding which can only lead to a positive place. It can't lead to a bad place. Oh my goodness, only good came out of it. Mm-hmm. Our students were, I mean, they were beaming that night. We went back and we debriefed for an hour, an hour and a half, and they, when the whole trip was done, that was their highlight. I could see why, and uh, I'm, I'm sitting here almost giddy thinking about the prospect of that happening. Mm-hmm. And, and I think probably it dispels a certain, maybe a, a somewhat unconscious uh, view, or maybe for some people it's, it's an overt uh, sense, that with people who practice religion, you know, whether it be Islam, whether it be Christianity, that there's a certain arrogance that mm-hmm. comes along with it that would um, eliminate the possibility of a gathering such as what you just described, but instead of arrogance, it's it's just basically saying, hey, you know, we uh, we're so it shows confidence, saying we we can walk into any scenario, have a conversation, let there be you know a level of co- connection, human to human, and if there, we don't agree on certain things, that's okay. At least now, maybe you understand me, and I understand you. I think the word you said is very interesting: a confidence. Yes. Why would somebody go into a mosque or any other religious faith, mm-hmm. present their view, and have questions fired at them for an hour? Right. It's because they're confident that their position is true. Right. One of the things I do in churches is, is I do this atheist role play. I call it an atheist encounter where they know I'm a Christian. Right. I put glasses on. I go into atheist mode, and I'll give an atheist viewpoint five or six minutes, and then I take questions from the audience. And then I just kind of shoot it down uh-huh. one by one. And always the frustration brews about 25, 30 minutes into it. I've been called names. I've been personally <laughs> attacked. And then I'll stop uh-huh. and I'll say, before we answer some of these questions, I want to know, how did you treat me? And I'm telling you, it's like people go, oh, shoot. Right. I didn't even realize that. I was trying to win you in an argument. I was trying to show that you were wrong. I was trying to show how smart I am. I wasn't interested in learning and really treating you in love as a human being. And then I'll ask the audience, and I've thought about this. I've done this, I don't know if I'd say hundreds of times, but dozens and dozens of times to youth pastors, to parents, to school teachers, to junior high students, stadiums of 6,000 to 12 students. And consistently students get defensive. People get, Christians get defensive, angry, and sometimes even hostile a Mm -hmm. little bit. Why? You know why? Because we don't know what we believe and why. Mm. We don't have the confidence that it's really true. Right. So when someone starts pressing us and asking us tough questions, how do you know the Bible's true? Why does God allow evil? Can't all religions be true? What about evolution? Mm. If we haven't thought about it and someone presses us, it's human instinct to get defensive. Right. But Jesus said, love God with your heart and with your soul and with your mind. Mm. Peter said, be ready with an answer. Mm. When we take the time to know as Christians what we believe and why we believe it, it builds tremendous confidence and a willingness to engage people lovingly and thoughtfully with very different views than our own. So non-believers are not the enemy, which is probably, I think, the mindset. And it's interesting because when you really think about, when I really think about what you're saying relative to the, the confidence you know, being the thing that allows you to lighten up and walk into a circumstance and, and mm-hmm. just feel I'm here and I'm, I have the confidence to be able to have this communication, not worried that somehow it might rock my world or destabilize my, my experience of life, but rather that uh, there's a way maybe to gain greater understanding here. It's, sure. it, if it, I would say that from people outside looking in, I think the, the if they were to be asked, you know, the non-Christian world, would Christians um, do they feel like non-believers are the enemy and that uh, you know that they can't be interacted with? It's it's really not that way. I don't think it's just Christians. I think we live in a divisive, argumentative culture. Yeah. It's us versus them, and I think there's reasons for this. Mm-hmm. One reason is I think there's a lot of brokenness and hurt in relationships. We've seen suicide and depression rising. Mm -hmm. Rick Warren famously said, hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. So whatever your faith is or no faith, if there's emotional and relational brokenness, then it's much easier to argue with someone and dehumanize them than to listen to them and treat them humanely. I think we also just live in a culture that's so rushed, we're so busy and we're so distracted. 
And we also are so afraid of political correctness that what if I say the wrong thing, mm -hmm. I'm gonna get attacked and shamed. Right. So people are afraid in relationship publicly to say stuff, so they go online under a pseudo name, just start attacking people because they have no natural outlet for it. Mm -hmm. So I found just learning to listen, learning to know what we believe, having conversations, trying to have sympathy, and thinking, okay, people with different belief systems aren't the enemy. In fact, they might be right. Mm -hmm. And if they're right, I should believe it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home, and my father, I mean, he's been in ministry over 50 years, and he's written over 150 books. Wow. He's probably spoken to more young people live than anybody in history. Wow. Done 250 debates. I only mention this because I went through a period of doubt in my life where I had a lot of questions. And I started thinking, I know my, my, I know my parents mean well, but what if I was raised in a different family? Hmm. If I was raised in a Muslim family, would I just be a Muslim? How do I really know the Bible's true? How do I really know Jesus rose from the grave? And it was kind of an existential, mild crisis. I don't want to overstate it for me. Hmm. And I remember sitting down with my dad, not knowing how he's going to respond. He spent his whole life defending and proclaiming the truth of Christianity. His son's like, yeah, I don't know if I buy this. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and said, Dad, I, I want to tell you something. I, I want to know what's true, but I don't know that I'm convinced Christianity's true. I felt like I had to be honest with him. Mm -hmm. He looks at me, he goes, son, I think that's great. And I remember thinking, Dad, did you hear anything <laughs> that I just said? He goes, look, I didn't raise you to just believe something because I told you. I raised you to follow after truth mm -hmm. and to seek after truth. And wherever it leads you, embrace it. He said, I'm convinced if you really seek after truth, you'll end up or continue believing in Jesus because Jesus is the truth. But follow truth, even if you don't like it, even if it's uncomfortable. Seek after truth. That's something my dad has just hammered into me. And he always tells me, even in politics, read both sides before you make up your mind. Okay. And I think the only reason we look at people as enemies, the only reason we don't listen more and we get so angry is because we hear one side of the argument, we think everybody else is stupid. Well, if you only look at one side, then of course everyone else seems stupid. Right. But if you read both sides, if you take the time to listen to people, at least understand where they're coming from, mm -hmm. then it's much harder to be in this argumentative, he's the enemy, rather than just loving people in the way that Jesus said we're supposed to love people. Well, you know, and there's so much, you know, as you're citing, so, you know, the, the level of acrimony in the world and polarization is mm. unprecedented, at least in my lifetime, I think. Mm. And I think everything you just said speaks to the root of that and, and why that exists. So um, it's, uh, you know, and I think the solution is, uh, you know, basically creating understanding. You know, and I think sometimes it's the inward look, right? Saying, okay, where am I? And you having, I mean, I, I think it's an amazing reflection given that you, you're born in a Christian household. Your father, you know, is such a uh, large figure in the Christian mm -hmm. community. And that you would still ask the question, and this is, this is really, I think, a, a startling question. Hmm. What if I was born in a Muslim household? What might have happened? And, and all of a sudden, you can start to say, okay, but and there are people who are. And now, how should I relate to them? And mm -hmm. it, I, I just think that that's an amazing lens to look through that would cause pause for anybody. Because maybe the Muslim, if they said, what if I was born in a Christian household? You mm -hmm. see? It, it really, I think everybody can ask that question. Mm. I think that's an, one of the most amazing soul-searching questions I've heard. Mm. So uh, I, I just wanted to point that out. Well, at least minimally, it can help us be sympathetic yeah. to people who see the world differently and be a little bit more self-critical about what we believe and why we believe it. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, you're a father, mm -hmm. three children, mm -hmm. and you talked about your experience growing up as the son. Mm -hmm. Now, what's it like for you being the father? That's a great question. I love being a dad, have three kids, and spending time with my kids is, you know, up there with my wife, kind of my pride and joy, some of the most fun things I do. And you know, we live in a world where there's a lot of different beliefs, and obviously I want my kids to be Christians. I want to embrace the belief system that we have. I'd be lying if I said differently. Right. But I also know that my kids need to grow up and make some decisions for themselves. I can pray for them, I can guide them, I can hopefully model for them what it means to be a Christian. And at some point, they're gonna have to decide what they believe and go for it. Right. But you know, they know I'm gonna love them no matter what. So I just try to, when we go on these trips I've been describing, we take my, my son with me. Mm -hmm. My daughter was there when we were at the mosque. I wanted her to meet some people who are Muslims and just have a cross-cultural experience right. and not just 
view them through the lens of which, you know, maybe we see on TV in a movie or the news or something like that. So I, I try to guide my kids, try to have conversation with them, pray for them. It's fun to be a dad. Yeah. But, you know, when it's all said and done, they're going to have to make some decisions about their life spiritually, and I, I can't make those decisions for them. So what's, uh, what's interesting, I think, in part, is that, okay, you're born in a Christian household, and, uh, and, and you've uh, committed your career and life and faith and spirit to this. Um, what about the parents that are Christian, but you know, their entire life and career is wrapped up in something very independent of Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever their job might be in any type of a company, uh, maybe in a blue collar world or maybe they're professionals or what have you. And uh, you know, they haven't had the, uh, I guess I could say the experience of getting deeply academic into being able to build their confidence based on a lot of, of education and reasoning that's gone on, yet they want to still live the Christian life have a Christian household, et cetera. Mm -hmm. what, what are the resources or what, what, is, what do you think are their challenges and solutions in that particular scenario? Yeah, I'd say a few things. I'd say parents don't have to be the experts on everything. I'm not the expert on plenty of things right. in my life. You know, the other thing I would say is if you just take the time to read a couple books mm -hmm. and make loving God with your mind a part of who you are, you've already set yourself apart from most people in the culture who don't read thoughtful books. Right. So I would say to those parents, I'd say, what does it look like in your life and in your family to make just loving God with your mind and thinking Christianly one spiritual discipline? Right. What book can I read? What conference can I go to? Who can I find in my church, track them down and have a conversation with that person and start to learn and grow in that aspect of my life? The other thing though is part of being a, a Protestant Christian mm -hmm. is I don't believe there's sacred and then secular vocations. Mm -hmm. It's not like what I do is more spiritual than someone who's a doctor, a teacher, a plumber, a car mechanic. Mm -hmm. As I look scripturally, it was Abraham Kuyper who said, there's not a square inch of creation out of which God does not cry out, it's mine. Mm -hmm. So whatever profession you have, what does it look like to love God and honor God and serve God through that profession? That's a question that we need to be asking. Now, sadly, a lot of Christians don't ask this question. I met two mechanical engineers who had been in church their entire lives, and they were in their 30s. And I said, what does it look like distinctly to be a Christian mechanical engineer? How do you apply your faith to your profession? Mm -hmm. They looked at each other, they looked at me, and they said, I don't know, we haven't thought about that. And I thought, what a shame. <laughs> so their spiritual life is Wednesday night at Bible study, Sunday morning at church, but they're not actively thinking through what it means to be a Christian, to live out their profession in the workplace. So it becomes compartmentalized. It absolutely becomes to, you know, compartmentalized. Uh, and, and I guess this is a very interesting point because they're trying to mechanize their Christianity or their faith as compared to it being a spiritual experience that's a mm -hmm. part of every aspect of their life. So, uh, so in a sense, and I guess that can get frustrating, right? I mean, if there's people who are living sort of this compartmentalized or mechanistic faith, they're going to probably be frustrated with what their experience is as compared to saying there's, there's a, uh, you know, I have one view that, that applies to my, all the important categories of my life, mm -hmm. my parenting, my health and fitness, mm -hmm. my career, my, finance, my finances. I mean, all, you know, everybody's got all these important categories of life, but if you compartmentalize the spiritual side is what I'm hearing and, extra, and, and kind of separate it from everything else, you're still not really having the experience. I think that's right. Deuteronomy 6.4, which is arguably the central passage of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. When Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? He cites the Shema, this mm -hmm. passage, love God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and with your strength. Mm -hmm. And then he says, you know, talk these to your kids. This is a Deuteronomy 6.4 in the verses that are following by Moses. He says, talk to them when you wake up in the morning, when you lie down at night, when you walk along the road. In other words, what Moses is saying is make God a natural part of the rhythm of your life. Yeah. Refuse to compartmentalize spiritual things to Sunday morning and Wednesday night, but our spiritual beliefs should shape the way we look at culture, shape the way we compete in sports, shape the way 
we have a relationship, shape the kind of worker that we are. Mm -hmm. This is what it means to be a Christian, to have a holistic worldview that shapes everything that we do. And I think when we begin to think this way, we avoid the frustration that you're talking about. It's very liberating. Yeah. There's a peace of God in a sense that every single day, how I live my life matters for eternity, for the kingdom. Right. That's when the Christian worldview moves just out of church Sunday morning. And frankly, it's the exception that I've seen of churches that really help carefully teach a worldview and connect what is taught Sunday morning to people's lives and their jobs and their career. Now, of course, churches are challenged. They have 45 minutes. They have limited resources and time. I get that. But that's one of the challenges today. We live in a secular world so committed to compartmentalizing your faith. Mm. And yet Jesus says, I created everything. Mm. Faith should affect every single choice that you make. That's empowering to live that way as a Christian. Have you seen people who have recognize their compartmentalized spirituality or their faith in Christianity and then have made the switch? And what did you mm -hmm. see unfold when that happened? Uh, I think I see people just realize that, one, instead of pointing at others to be the Christian experts, oh, my youth pastor will do it. Oh, my pastor will do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, the missions pastor. People begin to take responsibility in their own life and realize, oh, I could lead a Bible study. Mm -hmm. I could learn how to have better spiritual conversations. I could learn to just engage people around me more thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. So it begins to transform the way people live. So rather, if you think about it this way, I saw a study about happiness, and it said that people who, there were three levels of kind of, of way you think about a job. One is a job, second is a career, third is a vocation. Mm -hmm. So a job is something you get and you move on. A career is long-term. A vocation is a sense of a calling, right. a higher, deeper purpose in life. There's actually people that had a vocation that were the most happy about life in, in sense of a contentment. Mm -hmm. So when Christians realize, I'm just going to work to get a paycheck. I'm honoring God through my work. This is an opportunity God has given me, and how can I represent Christ in how I do my job? And what would it look like to help other people come to Christ through my profession? They start to ask these questions and build a worldview. Mm -hmm. It moves from just having a job or a career to a vocation, mm -hmm. which just gives life such a deeper sense of meaning to yeah. it. Well, purpose, right? Now suddenly their purpose is expanded regarding, you know, regardless of what their job is. It just adds more, more meaning to it. I think that's right. Yeah, so uh, fascinating. So how important is community? in having um, you know, a Christian faith as far as being a part of a community? Well, I think we live out based on what we believe. Mm -hmm. So studies have shown that people who describe themselves as Christians live no differently than people who don't mm -hmm. in America. But people who describe themselves as Christians and have a Christian worldview, mm -hmm. who think like Jesus, mm -hmm. are more likely to live like Jesus. Uh -huh. But Worldviews are always best learned in community, mm -hmm. in relationship with one another. Mm -hmm. So it's not a coincidence that Jesus would break bread with somebody and share stories, talk with that person, share their life. So the only way we can pass on our values to the next generation is in relationship mm -hmm. with parents, with grandparents, with uncles, with coaches, with teachers. And this is something that's not accidental to Christianity. This is at the heart of it. God himself mm -hmm. is tri-personal, right. right? When we're invited to become a Christian, we're in a sense invited into the community of the one God who eternally exists as three persons. Mm -hmm. We're made in God's image to be in relationship with each other, to be in relationship with God, and it's that community that gives us meaning. It's community that gives us purpose. Right. And it's a community where we learn the certain truths that can set us free to go live out our faith in the world. It's sort of a difference between saying this is a, an abstraction in my mind as compared mm -hmm. to saying it's a living experience, you know, day to day. And uh, I, I'd imagine that, you know, when things are great, that's one thing. But when you know life gets tough or there's tragedy, having that mm -hmm. community is something that is uh, essential. I think it's community, and I think it's our belief system. Mm -hmm. It's both. So sometimes people just say, well, in the Christian faith, we just need community. We mm -hmm. got to show we have a great community, invite the world into it. Mm -hmm. Then there's other people say, no, we just need to preach and proclaim truth. Mm -hmm. I think it's both. 
In one of his letters to the Thessalonians, Paul says, I not only gave you the gospel, but my very own life. Mm. It's both. Yeah. When people look in in our broken world and see a loving, genuine, not perfect, but a real community of people that is so appealing and powerful. But non-Christians can have community. What sets our community apart is there's the Holy Spirit that's there. We have a common brotherhood and we have truth. So when people are suffering, yes, it's community that helps them, but it's also their belief system. I saw a study by Dennis Prager in his book, Happiness is a Serious Problem, and he saw people that had suffered the loss, married couples that had suffered the loss of a child mm -hmm. prematurely. Mm -hmm. Most of them were either divorced or separated. Just the pain of that would mm -hmm. rip relationships apart. And he asked the question, why would some couples be able to stay together and some couples couldn't? And his conclusion was, if they had a belief system in place mm -hmm. that could make sense of such a tragedy, they were far more likely to withstand the pain and the hurt that comes from the loss of a child. So suffering and evil, for somebody to withstand it, has to have a framework, has to have a worldview, mm -hmm. a belief system that doesn't make the pain go away, but at least understand God is with me. God can redeem this for good. Mm -hmm. We live in a broken world and community together, mm -hmm. I think is the recipe to help people keep a lasting faith. I think that's a profound thought, um, the idea of uh, people having a similar worldview or sense of life. Um, and I think also with what you're saying, and it kind of ties back into our earlier conversation, having the belief is one thing, but having confidence in the belief is mm -hmm. another thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where, because what happens is without the confidence, you say, well, I have the belief, but then tragedy happens. And it's, since if it's weak, then the belief probably isn't serving you like it should as compared to saying I have confidence in the belief. So when adversity comes, I have, I have a foundation you know, to mm -hmm. be able to process it. I think that's a great way to put it. So think about it this way. There's a difference between knowing that something is true mm -hmm. and knowing that you know that it is true. Mm. Talk There's about a that. huge difference. Yeah. So I might have students who know a right answer on the test, but they haven't studied. Mm -hmm. So they know it, but they don't know that they know it. So they don't have the confidence. So they'll second guess themselves and sometimes get it wrong. Mm -hmm. But if you've studied, you not only know it, you know that you know it. So with confidence, you put the right answer down. Mm -hmm. well, our churches are filled with people who know the truth. But it's exception to find someone who knows the truth, but who also knows that he or she knows the truth. Brings confidence not only in suffering, but a willing to share their faith, a willing to live out this faith in the world and all the challenges that it brings. That's why training in apologetics, training in theology is so important, because it helps us not only know truth, but in our minds we can know that what we know is true. Mm. And that brings real conviction. Wow, so you've uh, obviously you're an extraordinarily gifted uh, communicator and thinker, and you've mm. chosen uh, you know, uh, teaching as you know, a central part of, of what you do. What do the next 10 years look like for you? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Well, I'm gonna take three months off to coach my son's JV basketball team. Awesome. That's you're you're a college important. basketball player yourself. Right? I was yeah. in the past, <laughs> not, not anymore, yeah. that's for sure. Uh, you know, I'm busy. I have a lot of great opportunities. But one of the things that been, has been in my mind is you know what you love by what you're willing to sacrifice for it, mm -hmm. right? What yeah. we're willing to really sacrifice for shows what we love. Mm -hmm. I have some neat writing, speaking opportunities, and I believe God has gifted me with that. My wife's behind me saying, go, go, use those things for the kingdom. Right. But I've got young kids, and I don't want to miss out on that window mm -hmm. that I have with them. So I've got some book projects I wanna work on. I wanna keep teaching. Biola's an amazing place. Mm -hmm. God has wired me to teach. I read a book and I come in and I'm like, honey, and my son, I like explain stuff. They're like, dad, we're watching TV. <laughs> I just, it's just the way God has wired me. Right. So I wanna keep doing those things, speaking, teaching, have a YouTube channel and blogging. I mean, those things are all fun. Mm -hmm. But I also, over the next 10 years, I wanna be a good dad and I wanna be a good husband. What's the biggest challenge Christianity faces right now? I would say probably the shift from people. So let me take a step back. Mm -hmm. My dad's spoken on 1,200 university campuses. And when he started in the 60s and 70s, people would say, well, give me some evidence. That's not true. Prove it. Right. People don't say that as much anymore, although some people do. 
they'll say, what right do you have to say that? Mm -hmm. That's hurtful mm -hmm. because we've shifted from seeing even truth being something objectively out there that we can form our life to, to being whatever I feel is true for me is true. Mm -hmm. In fact, now I think just in the past few years, we have seen the first time we've seen in culture where even feelings trump science. Mm. Even feelings trump science. So to me, at the heart of our culture is, if you, you define for yourself, as Justice Anthony Kennedy said, he said essentially, you get to define your own meaning and concept of existence in life. Mm -hmm. We live in such a radical, individualistic, and relativistic culture that says, as long as you believe something, you feel it's right and live it out, you're free and that's true, go do it. Anybody who says differently is a bigot. Christianity comes along and says, actually, true freedom is found mm -hmm. and not based upon living just according to your feelings. Mm -hmm. True freedom is found in living according to your design as God has made you to be. True freedom is found in submitting yourself to God's desires. Mm -hmm. True freedom is found in doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So there's this cultural move radically towards the individual that's defining freedom in the way that is contrary to the way Christianity describes it. And I think deep in their hearts, people know that this is actually mistaken, but they don't reflect upon it. So I wrote a blog recently on Star Wars. And if you notice in the Star Wars films, there's this underlying theme that you're only free when you submit to an authority and you're obedient. Mm -hmm. So Luke can only be free when he submits to Yoda. Mm -hmm. Rey can only be free in the more recent Star Wars when she stops resisting the force but aligns herself with an objective truth outside of herself. And I think saying objective truth, because it's not a blind submission. It's You're not. There's an objective truth, and now if you draw that conclusion, you, you submit to saying, okay, I surrender to this because this is the truth. Yes, it's not blind faith. Right. It's reasonable, but it goes so contrary mm -hmm. to this deep-seated belief. When I ask young people, how do you define freedom? They'll say, doing whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. So in terms of challenges for people to understand Christianity, it's this individualistic, feeling-based culture where our world is moving towards rather than understanding, no, true freedom. Like David says in the Psalms, I delight in the law of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Moses says in Deuteronomy 10, here's the commandments God has given you for your own good. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because you know, what you're describing basically is, is relativism, right? I mean, you know, basically, oh, your truth is your truth, your truth is your truth, and you, know, you just can be a whim worshiper based on that. Hmm. You feel this way today, you feel that way tomorrow, and you, just, you, you start to, rather than worship uh, something foundational, it's about whims and how you feel in the range of a moment. And, and I think that's a challenge to humanity in general, independent mm -hmm. of a particular faith. You know, is the, it, it, it's kind of a disintegration of any discipline mm -hmm. around life uh, that, that can move it in, in any kind of a positive direction. So uh, I think that that's mm -hmm. a, very, uh, you know, a very profound observation and mm -hmm. something that, uh, that I think needs to be corrected you know, in our culture because uh, it's got a lot of ripple effects that I think lead to bad places. Well, I, I think you're right about that. I don't know how to fix it. Yeah. G.K. Chesterton said, even at the turn of the last century, he said, look, you can, you can free a camel from the zoo, but don't free a camel from its hump. Mm -hmm. Don't free a tiger from its stripes. Right. We're only free when we act in accordance with the way we're designed to be, right. when we live our life in accordance with reality. Mm -hmm. If God exists and he's made us in his image and he's designed this world, then we are only free when we live the way God has designed him to live. Right. So for young people to see that truth is just so contrary to all the voices in our culture that are increasingly proclaiming a different message. Yeah, it reminds me of a quote from Rand. She said, uh, in order for nature to be commanded, it must be obeyed. <laughs> mm. And, and uh, I think it's, a, it's just alignment, right? So mm. that's, a, that's a, a very, I think, powerful insight. So, you know, for, for people now that um, are, you know, observing mm -hmm. this um, as kind of a final note for them, uh, what, what, what message do you want to send them off with from this conversation? Well, I, I guess I'd say to people that, that God is good. Mm -hmm. 
And even in our world today, all the messages that we hear is that Christianity has caused all these problems in the past and Christians are bigoted. Well, Christianity has caused some problems and some Christians are bigoted. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny that. But if you understand who God is, if you understand who Jesus is, mm -hmm. it's only in relationship to him that we have true freedom. We are made to love God and to love other people. Anything else we try to do in our life is going to end up leaving us empty. It's only meaningful. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But this isn't a blind faith. This is actually a reasoned-based faith and belief system. That's what sets Christianity apart. That Jesus died, was buried, on the third day rose again. Mm -hmm. And we have consistent early testimony that this historical message is true. And the first people who saw it we're all willing to suffer and die for that belief. That's powerful. I should say, you know, our quest here is to look at the history, the evidence, and the inspiration. Mm -hmm. I think you've uh, attended to all three beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for well, your time. You're too kind. Thanks for having me. Well, wasn't that an incredible journey from the mind of Sean McDowell? Really compelling information there and delivered in a way that I just felt was open, honest, and powerful. So thanks for joining me for this interview. Next up, you're in for a real treat. First, we're gonna start out with a tour of the Garden Tomb, which is one of the two proposed sites where Jesus was buried. Once we leave there, we're gonna sit down and have a conversation with Tisha Michelle. Now, I have to tell you, Tisha was a godsend to us. She was our tour guide throughout Israel. She is so well-connected. She tours dignitaries and celebrities, and we were lucky to have her. What's amazing about Tisha is not only the way that she organizes the whole tour, and how she got us into places that were very difficult to get into, but she takes what's written in the Bible, and as she's touring, she turns it into Technicolor. It really comes alive. You're gonna love Tisha, so check this out. And then right after that, we're going to the Mount of Beatitudes. And this is the place where the famous Sermon on the Mount occurred. And I have to tell you, I'm getting a little goosebumps right now just thinking about it because it was such an impactful experience to be there and understand what happened there. So let's dive right in. Enjoy. Well, right behind me is the garden tomb, the tomb that many believe is where Jesus was buried and from whence he rose from the grave. Well, the tomb itself was unearthed in 1867. And a couple decades later, uh, some began to suggest that it might be the tomb where uh, Jesus was buried from whence he rose, mostly because of its proximity uh, to a place that many were already uh, believing might be Golgotha. We're a couple hundred yards away, and in the Gospel according to John, we're told that in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden there was a tomb. Uh, so that implies a sense of nearness. Uh, and therefore, the same people that were believing that what we call Skull Hill today uh, might indeed be the biblical Golgotha uh, began to say, well, maybe in that case, this is the tomb in which Christ was buried. I mean, it is important to bear in mind that the tomb behind me uh, is not identical to what it looked like in the days of Christ. Uh, the interior of the tomb uh, was somewhat modified by the Byzantine Christians. And then the Crusaders uh, were using this area for uh, quite irreligious purposes. Uh, and they built a structure right in front of the tomb. And that greatly changed uh, the way it looks today. It is very different from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I think both play a very important role uh, in the city of Jerusalem as witnesses, as it were, uh, to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, but there are many Christians that simply do not connect uh, to the mode of worship in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, and to the church itself. There is no space there where Protestant Christians or Evangelical Christians could, for instance, take communion together. And so uh, this site, uh, besides having some 
legitimate reasons uh, why one might think that this is indeed the place where, where Jesus was buried from whence he rose. It also fulfills a very important spiritual function. It's a place of Christian witness and Christian worship where every Christian, uh, no matter what background they're coming from, can come and meditate on the crucifixion of Christ, celebrate his resurrection, uh, join with a group of people and take communion together here in this garden. It's especially been important to uh, evangelical Christians as they come to Jerusalem. It really has become sort of the spiritual home uh, for evangelical pilgrims here in Jerusalem. So the area that uh, might be Golgotha is just 200 yards away from Damascus Gate, which is uh, today's main northern gate of the city. And today's Damascus Gate is located pretty much exactly in the same location where the main northern gate was also in the days of Christ. And indeed, that proximity to the city walls, that proximity to the city gate and to the major road which used to come out of the Damascus Gate and connect Jerusalem to the cities of the north, is one of the primary reasons why uh, many began to point to uh, Skull Hill as a possible location for Golgotha, since we know that the Romans always used to crucify on the sides of the major roads, places that were accessible to the populace. The purpose of the crucifixion was to instill fear in the hearts of the passers-by. It was a way to uh, project the power of the empire. Uh, after all, those who were crucified uh, were usually those who were uh, tried for some form of, uh, of rebellion, uh, whether it was a slave rebelling against his master or someone rebelling against the authority of the empire. Tisha, I'm very excited to have this conversation as you are our mentor wow. <laughs> and tour guide for Israel. So tell me about what got you involved in, uh, in being here. I mean, obviously, you're, we'll hear the accent. You're from the United States, but you live right. here now. How'd you end up in the position of introducing people to Israel? Well, it all started when I was nine months old. <laughs> My mother pioneered gospel, uh, first of all, gospel music in the United States. and. Uh, band, uh, bands like the Gaithers and uh, Larry Gatland and uh, the Oak Ridge Boys and all kinds of the all of the gospel bands. I grew up backstage with Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash wow. and, and had a great childhood and we were filling coliseums back when I was just a little child and someone came to my mom in 1968 and asked her have you ever wanted to bring a tour to Israel? You're filling up these coliseums why don't you advertise a tour? And my mom took her first tour in 1968. I was nine months old and fell in love with the country. Yeah. To walk where Jesus walked, to walk where the prophets walked, it changed her life. And she immediately went back to the uh, Israel government tourist office and worked with the Israeli government to help them start a Christian market. She believed that every Christian had to come to Israel because it would change their lives. To see where, to see where Jesus walked and the prophets walked, it makes the Bible no longer black and white, right. but technicolor. Right. So as I came to the land, as a child, on multiple tours, I literally fell in love with the country. There's nothing like it. The scripture says that he'll comfort those that comfort Israel. The scripture says he'll bless those that bless Israel. And, and the scripture even says that they're the apple of his eye. And so even as a little child, I used to weep when I would leave the country. And I knew that that was my destiny. I'd be back here. And in 1993, I made Aliyah, which means I immigrated to Israel. and. Um, Never, ever, ever regretted it for one moment. Wow. So uh, now you have the, I guess, maybe call it the privilege or uh, the blessing to be able to uh, take a lot of people through Israel. And, and you seem to be the guide to the stars who come here. <laughs> <laughs> Your reputation precedes you. So uh, you know, are you allowed to talk about some of the people that you've uh, introduced to Israel? Sure. To be honest with you, I never take that for granted. Mm -hmm. I always say it's, it's, it's God's favor. Yeah. He's opened so many doors for me here in the land, and it's been amazing to wake, work with some amazing people. Uh, Sarah Palin, mm -hmm. I helped her with her first trip to Israel, mm -hmm. and uh, also Governor Huckabee. I've, w I've worked with the Governor Huckabee, Huckabee for many yeah. years, yeah. yes, yeah. Governor Mike Huckabee. Uh, many, many gospel music and, uh, and country music uh, artists. Senator Rand Paul, the um, president of South Korea, and uh, many, many, many more. So let's talk about some of the highlights in Israel that are very noteworthy. 
we could probably spend a very long time because right. there's so many. Right. But let's start up north uh, with the Galilee. So uh, first you have the Sea of Galilee. What can you tell us about that? Oh, the Sea of Galilee is an amazing place. First of all, it's the second lowest point in the earth mm -hmm. and part of the Syrian African Rift. Beautiful, beautiful place. But the Sea of Galilee is special because it saw most of the miracles of Jesus. In fact, the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee saw three quarters of the gospel. And small towns like Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazim, those three villages saw most of the miracles of Jesus. So very, very special. He's, it's where he walked on the water. It's where he spent most of his ministry. Wow. So um, let's talk about Capernaum. So what can you tell us about Capernaum? Capernaum is his own hometown. Scripture says that he was from Nazareth. And remember, he grew up in Nazareth. And a prophet wasn't accepted in his own hometown. And so the next thing we know, the infuriated people of Nazareth were ready to throw him off a, uh, the brow of a hill. Yeah. And the next thing we know, he reappears in Capernaum, which he calls his own hometown. Peter lived in Capernaum, and that became literally the center of his ministry. And so many things we can't even imagine happened in Capernaum. John 21 says that not, there's not enough books in the world to contain the miracles that took place in those three short years of his life. And most of those miracles, many of them, happened at Capernaum. What are some of the places that are visited there? Uh, is Peter's house, I believe, is there? Right. When you're visiting and touring through Capernaum, one of the, one of the highlights, obviously, is the House of Peter. Mm -hmm. And so, if you really think about it, that could have been, first of all, we know that Peter was from Bethsaida. Right. He was not from Capernaum, but his wife was from Capernaum, and so that became his own city, too. And so, if you think about the House of Peter, that could have been where the paralytic was lowered through the roof. Right. It could have been where Jesus stayed. It could have been where Peter's mother-in-law was healed from uh, fever, mm -hmm. and it could have been the first church. So, what an amazing find. Yeah, uh, Bethsaida. Mm -hmm. So, the location of Bethsaida is somewhat controversial, but there's a new archaeological dig, isn't there? Well, it was very exciting to be able to sit down with Professor Aviam and learn more about the new possible location of the uh, Bethsaida in El Araj. And up until then, Etel was the calculated location of Bethsaida. It was Edward Robinson in 1838 that believed that was the biblical Bethsaida, also known as Julius. Mm -hmm. But uh, things are changing, and so we're excited to find out more and more. But we've even found Roman ruins there and possibly a Byzantine church. So we might have just found the new or the real accurate Bethsaida, which makes more sense because it's much closer to the Sea of Galilee. And we know that that was a fisherman's town. In fact, Bethsaida means house of the fishermen. Right. And so we know it had to be near the Sea of Galilee and um, also home to several of the disciples and where Jesus healed that blind man. Yeah, so the significance of Bethsaida is the fact that it was home to several disciples and there was a miracle performed there that a mm -hmm. blind man uh, healed there. So that's very exciting. And in that same area, mm -hmm. actually all these things are in pretty close proximity as you cited. Uh, we also have a, a find of a synagogue that existed in the time of Jesus. What is that? Right. Well, these are brand new excavations, and so just over the past couple of years, we've started to excavate the, the city of Magdala, which is the traditional birthplace of Mary of Magdalene. So in Magdala, we actually found a synagogue from the time of Jesus, from the Second Temple period. Wow. Now you see, in Capernaum, we have a synagogue, but the base was from the time of Jesus. The actual synagogue you're looking at is third or fourth century synagogue. Right. But in Magdala, we found a synagogue from the time of Jesus. And we believe he was there. And it's just amazing that all of the things that they're finding, but a very, very significant site. Now, where that's located on the Sea of Galilee, um, it, you know, there's many references to uh, crossing over. Uh, and, that, so, and that's where some boats and fishermen would be in, in uh, Magdala, right? So is it supposed that you know, he would stop at that synagogue and, and then catch a ride across the water to uh, his hometown? Or you know, what is speculated about that? Sure, yeah, I'm sure that he took one of the boats many, many, many times to Capernaum and what scripture says to the other side, right. which is the Decapolis. And so the Southern Golan Heights on the Eastern side of the Sea of Galilee is the Decapolis. There were 10 pagan Hellenistic cities all on the other side of the sea 
And that's why if they were pagan and Hellenistic, that's the only reason there would be swine there. Right. And that's where the miracle of the swine took place. Right. So, and you can actually see those areas right from uh, Capernaum and uh, Magdala and these other places. Right. Right. So also in that same general vicinity is the Mount of Beatitudes. What can you tell us about that? Well, that's actually where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. which is the longest sermon in the Gospels and probably the most known sermon of Jesus. But what are Beatitudes? They're attitudes for kingdom people to be in. So that's a, it's a very, very important location. I think in understanding Jesus, you have to go back to the Jewish roots of Jesus right. and who he was and what he was trying to teach. See, Jesus was a kingdom person. Mm -hmm and he was continually a kingdom person. He was continually in kingdom attitude. Yeah, and, and uh, the Sermon on the Mount, of course, very famous, mm -hmm. and it would make sense, I guess, from a proximity standpoint, that you know, he would have that sermon there, it's still in that same general vicinity where it seemed his ministry was, and it, it's very exciting to be uh, able to hit all these spots and experience them uh, you know, without having to drive days in between. <laughs> I think that's the thing that shocks people is that, that Israel's really a small country. I mean, about 95% of the Bible took place in an area of 150 by 50 miles. Wow. And three quarters of the gospel took place in a tiny little triangle that's just several miles big and that saw most of, most of the miracles and most of the gospel. And another thing is in this small country, the size, I think, landmass-wise, I think you said the size of New Jersey, That's right? That's right. Where I'm from. Right. And, uh, but there's five different climates? Yes, five different climate zones. And so I always say God gave us a little bit of everything. Yeah. So, and one day you can be in the snow and at, in the desert. You can be by the beautiful Mediterranean Sea. You can be in the forest and, um, and everything else, everything in between. Tell me about Mount Carmel. So Mount Carmel is a beautiful location. In fact, from Mount Carmel, we can literally have a panoramic view. We can see so many biblical stories right in front of our eyes. Even the Mediterranean. So on one side, you can see Caesarea by the sea. The other side, you can see the Valley of Armageddon, where the final uh, battle is supposed to take place according to Revelations. And so from Mount Carmel, that's where we hear about the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. That's where Elijah defeated the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. To, and that was an area of the worship of of Baal and Asherah, the gods of fertility. Mm. And obviously Elijah's coming in at that point and saying, how long are you gonna falter between two gods? You gonna choose Baal or are you gonna choose the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And that's where he defeats the prophets of Baal. Wow, that's a, a pretty historic place. It really is. Well, of course, uh, one of the stars of the Bible, John the Baptist, uh, had his ministry in the Jordan River. Uh, right. So tell us about the Jordan River. Well, the Jordan River, first of all, is a, a very, a very important river to us in Israel, in modern day Israel. The name Jordan in Hebrew is Yarden, which actually means descending from the Dan. And the Dan is the main water source of the Jordan River. That's in the north of the country where the biblical tribe of Dan was. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's three rivers that join together that form the Jordan River in the north. Jordan River actually is the main water source for the Sea of Galilee. Pours into the Sea of Galilee in the north and pours out of the Sea of Galilee in the south and all the way down to the Dead Sea. Whereas the, they say that the, the river of life pours into the Sea of Death. All right. And so that's where the Jordan River is where obviously John the Baptist would have spent a lot of his time especially down in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Right, and uh, obviously it's where Christ was baptized. That's right, that's where he met Jesus. Well, wow. Now let's talk about the city of Jerusalem. And boy, can that be a very long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the holy city. The that's holy right. <laughs> city. So it's, it's very spectacular uh, in its scope historically and spectacular you know, to, to witness in present day. So. One of the great vistas to observe the actual holy city is from the Mount of Olives. A lot of stuff happens there, so let's go through the highlights. Well, the Mount of Olives is special. Oh my goodness. When you, when you sit there and see the view of the Temple Mount, you can actually see Mount Moriah where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac, where the first and the second holy temple were just an amazing spot. But the Mount of Olives is rich. That's where, first of all, Jesus entered the city 
over the Mount of Olives. Mm -hmm. He looked out over the city from the Mount of Olives. He wept over the city. It's where he ascended to heaven and it's where he's going to come back. So it doesn't get better than that. That's literally holy ground. Right. And there now that exist on the Mount of Olives are, are many things to commemorate, you know, the, these things that you talked about. So what are some of the sites that you might stop, stop at? Well, first of all, you start off with the orientation over the city with that magnificent view. And then you make your way down the Palm Sunday Road, the traditional Palm Sunday Road. One of the stops you might take is the Church of Dominus Flewit, or that area where the Lord wept. Luke 19 tells us that he wept over the city. Mm. He actually foretold the destruction of the temple. Mm. And so the Lord wept over the city. He made his triumphal entry over the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. And then another site that you might visit, obviously, is the Garden of Gethsemane. So talk about the significance of that. Gethsemane actually means oil press. Mm. And that's where they would take the olives and make the olive oil. In fact, Gethsemane was a meeting place for Jesus and the disciples. And if you want to get technical about it, I'm sure that Jesus felt quite pressed his night in Gethsemane as he was praying. In fact, if you want to get really technical about it, that's where he shed his first drop of blood for us. Mm. Because sweating blood is, is, is a, an actual symptom of extreme stress. Mm. That's where Jesus prayed the disciples wouldn't stay awake. They couldn't stay awake. That's where he was betrayed and he spent his last night there in the garden. We'd also noticed on the Mount of Olives a bunch of old or ancient graves. Mm -hmm. What is all that? Well, the Mount of Olives is uh, the oldest and the largest Jewish cemetery in existence. Wow. And so you see um, many, many, many graves there. In fact, uh, if you're looking down on the Mount of Olives, you can see three valleys. And so one is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, is right down below, also known as the Kidron Valley. And that's where God is, according to Joel, going to judge the nations on account of how they've treated Israel. Wow. And in fact, Jehoshaphat means where God will judge. And in the Kidron Valley, we have the tomb of Zechariah and Absalom as well in the valley, wow. some of those ancient graves. And the other two valleys? Then the other two valleys, the other one is called the uh, Tyropian Valley, also known as the Cheesemakers Valley. Mm -hmm. And the third valley is called Gehenna, it means hell, where child sacrifice was made to the god Molech. But it's, it's really amazing. If you look at those valleys, you see scripture says that the Lord has implanted his name on Jerusalem. And if you look from an aerial view, it's as clear as day, you can actually see those valleys form this, which is the Hebrew letter Shin, which if you see every mezuzah or prayer box on every Jewish door, that stands for the word Shaddai, God. He didn't just say it, he literally implanted his name on the three valleys of Jerusalem. Now those valleys enwrap Zion, Mount Zion, which scripture, scripture says that the Lord abides in Zion. He says, this is my resting place forever. And then on Mount Zion, uh, don't we have the city of David? We do. So tell us about that. Well, the city of David is, first of all, it was the Jebusite city before David came into the area. And David conquered the city from the Jebusites. He unites the 12 tribes and makes it his eternal capital, Jerusalem. And so an amazing place and the archeological excavations there, daily we're finding new things, proving the Bible accurate all the time. And so uh, that, in the city of David, we found what we believe to be the shaft that David used in order to conquer the city from the Jebusites. Mm -hmm. Elat Mazar has done some excavations there and she thinks that they might've even found the palace of David. Wow. And Hezekiah's tunnel, was uncovered there in the pool of Siloam where Jesus healed the blind man. Yeah, exciting stuff. Now let's get into uh, Jerusalem proper, uh, the old city at least. Mm -hmm. uh, there's four quadrants, what are they? Mm -hmm. The uh, old city, are, uh, first of all, the walls of the old city were built by Suleiman the Magnificent in 1536, around 1536 AD, Ottoman Turkish walls. Mm -hmm. So today the walls of the city enclose four quarters, which are the Muslim, Christian, Jewish, and Armenian quarters inside the old city. So some of these sites of uh, historical significance, especially to uh, Christians, uh, I guess we talk about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, that's first of all, that's a church. When Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in 324 AD, he's, his mother Helena was sent to the region 
and she travels the land with early church fathers and she's led to these locations and designates the holy sites. Mm. So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was one of those sites that Helena believed to have found a portion of the cross there mm. and she believed that that was the location of Golgotha and the tomb. And so that is the final stations of what is called the Via Dolorosa, the Catholic Via Dolorosa, are at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. Now, that is the Catholic and the Orthodox location of the tomb and of Golgotha, but there's also a Protestant location, mm -hmm. which is the Garden Tomb. Both were quarries outside the old city walls, mm -hmm. and so we're not sure which so was accurate. So there's some accurate. scholarly debate you <laughs> know, between right. the two, but, uh, That's but right. at least, uh, yeah, they're, and they're not that far apart. You know, no, they're not. Other. There's a Tower of David, um, which uh, David never built. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us about the Tower of David. Right. More accurately, the Tal Tower of David Museum encloses many different layers of archaeological uh, excavations of the city of Jerusalem. But more significantly, the tower, the main tower, is considered the Psael Tower. And that was one of the towers, the base of it, that is, today. And that was one of the towers uh, that protected and guarded Herod's palace, Herod the Great. And so we know that that would be, Jesus was brought to Herod and judged there. Mm -hmm. And there are some exciting new excavations that are going on there. And um, we're very excited to see what else is uncovered there. You have, of course, uh, maybe the holiest site for uh, the Jewish faith, uh, the Western Wall. Mm -hmm. What does that represent? The Western Wall is actually the retaining wall of the Holy Temple, Mount Plaza. And um, so it was a retaining wall. Now when Herod, uh, when Herod renovated the second temple, mm -hmm. he leveled a portion of Mount Moriah. And he had to build a platform, so he built a platform about 12 soccer fields big mm -hmm. and enclosed it by retaining walls in order to hold this platform down. Mm -hmm. And so the western wall is the retaining wall of the Temple Mount compound. Now, you have to understand, you can see that I am wearing a coin, mm -hmm. and you see it's got a palm branch on it. Yes. Now, what did they wave when Jesus came down over the Mount of Olives? Palms. Palm branches. Mm -hmm. So, palm branches represented freedom during the time of Jesus, or for the Jewish people. And this is a Jewish revolt coin, a 2,000-year-old coin. So, you have to understand that when the evil emperor Hadrian took control after the destruction of the temple, he, in, in 132 AD, that started what was called the Second Jewish Revolt, the Bar Kokhva Revolt, under a rabbi by the name of Rabbi, rabbi Bar Kokhva. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, the Jewish people lost the Bar Kokhva Revolt and they were banned from coming to Jerusalem. But this revolt was started when Hadrian banned Jews from coming to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He would not allow Jerusalem, Jews to enter Jerusalem only one time a year mm -hmm. on Tish A. And that is the day the first and the second temples were destroyed. They were destroyed on the same day. Wow. In fact, even to today, that's a day that the Jews mourn and lament and fast about the destruction of both of their holy temples. So Hadrian banned Jews for coming. He allowed them to come back one time a year, and they obviously would come to the Wailing Wall. And that's why it got the name, the Wailing Wall, because Scripture says not a thing, n nothing would be left of the holy temple, not one stone. And so that is what the Jewish people had to come back to. In the desert near the Dead Sea, there's the site of Qumran. Why is that significant? Oh my goodness. We found in Qumran, first of all, we found in several caves, but we found the oldest scriptures in existence in Qumran in these caves. These scriptures predated anything we had by a thousand years. Wow. Unbelievable. So this is where the famous Dead Sea Scrolls you know, have been unearthed. We found scriptures from every single book of the Bible except for the book of Esther. And uh, I mean, what a wealth of knowledge. In fact, the book of Isaiah we found in its entirety. And it's a miracle it even existed. So, uh, and they're still digging there, aren't they? We're still finding, we found a cave not long ago. What are some of the theories as to how all these scrolls ended up there? Well, one of the theories, obviously the mainstream theory would obviously be the story of the Essenes, who you have to understand the Essenes were a group of Jewish people. Uh, they believed that they were the sons of light. They believed the rest of the world were the sons of darkness. They believed there was gonna be a final battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. They believed they were in the wilderness preparing the way for the Lord and fulfillment of scripture. And so one of the theories would be that the Essenes were the ones that copied these scriptures in the area of Qumran. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the main school of thought back, you know, up until a couple of years ago. 
Now the interesting thing though is, is that in a small place like that, in the, in the middle of the desert, for a couple of hundred years, how many scribes could there have been? There were many different hands in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It doesn't, even, it doesn't quite make sense. So one of the new theories is that perhaps that was a biblical library from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And in preparation for the destruction of the temple, they brought all these scrolls down, hid them in the caves, mm -hmm. all with the hopes that one day they'd be back to find them. And unfortunately, there was no one to come back. Mm -hmm. They were just planted there, waiting for us to be brought back to the land in fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, mm -hmm. for him to bring us back to our soil, mm -hmm. for a nation to be reborn, and the oldest scriptures in existence to be found for us to get our biblical birth right back. Another fairly recent discovery is the uh, Pool of Siloam. Tell us about that. Well, uh, we had the honor of touring with Eli Shukran, who was one of the archaeologists that uncovered the new Pool of Siloam. Now, up until a couple of years ago, we believed everyone visited a different Pool of Siloam, which was actually a pool from the Byzantine period. Mm -hmm. But the Pool of Siloam was discovered when there was actually a leak in a pipe, and they did some <laughs> excavations and uncovered this, the, the Pool of Siloam, the accurate Pool of Siloam, which is we, ama an amazing find. And what happened there? That's where Jesus healed the blind man. Uh -huh. And you might remember that miracle was a miracle where he used saliva. Mm -hmm. And um, this man had been blind from birth. And that's not the only miracle that Jesus used saliva. And I think it's interesting also with the man with the speech impediment and was deaf in the Decapolis. He used, he had a miracle, he used the saliva for his miracle. Mm -hmm. And also for the man in Bethsaida that, had, that was blind. And you think, if you go back to the Jewish beliefs of the time, you have to understand that the Jewish people believed that there were healing properties in the saliva of a firstborn Jewish male. That's why he would have done the miracle. And that took place at the Pool of Siloam. Tell me about Masada. Masada is an amazing place. It sits over the Dead Sea. And that was a fortress that, that Herod built in order to protect himself in times of trouble and just an amazing, amazing place. But Masada was the last stand of the Jewish people in the land. You see, when Masada fell, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Masada fell in 73 AD. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for a miracle from God that we would be brought back into our land, that would have been it. And one of the miracles of Masada is we actually found Dead Sea Scrolls all the way down to Masada. Wow. That's the southernmost point that we found Dead Sea Scrolls. And when we excavated in the, t in the, in the synagogue of Masada, we uncovered the book of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Not just that, Ezekiel 37. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine being in the place of Israel's last stand in the land? When Masada fell, we lost our land for 2,000 years. And here we are back. Prophecy is already fulfilled, and we uncover Ezekiel 37, prophesying that the Lord's going to bring us back into our land, breathe life into us, and a nation would be born again, and it was already a done deal. Amazing. Amazing. Tisha, I want to thank you for bringing Israel to light in such a spectacular way, and as you said, it becomes technicolor, That's right. and I think you're true to that word. Thank you so much. What a blessing to be with you. Tisha, where are we right now? We're right here on the Mount of Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. The Mount of Beatitudes is actually where the Sermon on the Mount took place. So the facility that we're standing in right now mm -hmm. is, is a Catholic structure that was built here? Yes, and it was built by orders of Mussolini. Uh -huh. Mussolini. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. And they built it to commemorate where the Sermon on the Mount took place. Now they built the church like most Byzantine churches in an octagonal structure. Mm -hmm. And that was in this case to commemorate each of the Beatitudes, all starting with the uh -huh. word blessed. Right. Uh, in Hebrew, the actual word is ashrei, which is not a, a, it's not blessed, it's actually happiness, better translated. Uh -huh. Not a ha ha ha, he 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 happiness, but a contentment and a happiness that God alone can give us. 
so this church was built in 1927, but most people and most scholars believe that the Sermon on the Mount actually took place just down below. Mm -hmm. There's a natural amphitheater uh, that the banana patch forms a natural amphitheater and the acoustics are phenomenal, so very likely down below was the accurate location. So the, obviously the Sermon on the Mount is a very famous part of the Bible mm -hmm. and, uh, and a very uh, foundational aspect of understanding you know, Christ's teachings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're on the north side of the, the Sea of uh, Galilee or right. all these other terms that they use for that. Mm -hmm. So basically uh, when, when Christ was uh, giving the sermon, he would have been doing it facing the sea. Well, the scripture says that he went up on a mountain, right? Uh -huh. And so we believe he was facing the sea mm -hmm. and addressing the crowd uh, down below, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so the crowd formed down below. He was up on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And so basically where we're standing now, we're looking out. So this is kind of the view he had while he was giving this inspired sermon. Right. Wow. So this area is where most scholars feel like the actual sermon took place. Right. So the area right here, actually forms a natural amphitheater. Mm -hmm. The acoustics are phenomenal. Yeah. And so although we do have the traditional church up here, this is where most scholars feel that yes. the Sermon on the Mount took place. Well, you could see it kind of rounds out. Mm -hmm. And so he would have, Jesus would have stood here and the crowds would have been right down there. Right. Yeah, it does make sense when you look at it visually. You can imagine the trees were people and he'd be up here yep. speaking to thousands down below. Wow, quite a sight. This area, this general area that we're in, right. uh, I think you said something like 75% of the gospel happens right around here, I mean, in a very tight area. Mm -hmm. So give me some background on the history of Jesus as it relates to this, this place. I think it's really important because we're starting right now, the, mm -hmm. uh, the center of his ministry. Like we said, three quarters of the gospel took place in a tiny little, like five, six mile triangle. Mm -hmm. And we're right here right now. But let's go back to who Jesus was. Now, he wasn't from this area. Uh -huh. Jesus actually grew up in Nazareth, uh, and we remember his famous synagogue speech in Nazareth. Right. And that infuriated, he quoted from the book of Isaiah and said, this is fulfilled before you. Right. It infuriated the people of Nazareth. They actually led him to a brow of a hill uh -huh. and wanted to throw him off. And scripture says that he disappeared from their midst right. and begins his public ministry right here. Mm -hmm. Now. It's, I think it's important to go back and realize who was Jesus? Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us that he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us that he grew up in Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And scripture tells us that he was a rabbi. Right. So much so, you know who called him rabbi? Not his followers. His followers called him master or Lord. Right. It was the Pharisees that uh, called him rabbi. So they weren't gonna give him any credit that he didn't deserve. Right. And so uh, also what's important is to realize that he would have um, been teaching like the rabbis of his time would have right. taught. Right. Jesus is our Messiah, mm -hmm. but how do we, you know, there's a lot of years we don't know where he was. Right. If you think about it, the last time we hear about him in the temple, he was 12. Mm -hmm. And the next thing he reappears right here at the age of 30. That's a lot of years you don't know where he was. Right. And from his hometown of Nazareth, which is you know, behind you, I think, mm -hmm. you know, as I'm looking, right. uh, how far are we from Nazareth? We're about a 30 minute drive. Yeah, so walking, it's <laughs> uh, uh, yes. a couple days maybe? Half, at, least, at least a day's walk, yeah. probably. Yeah. But we have to have a little bit of background on where he was, and I can take you all the way back to the age of three. Okay. You see, because Jewish, uh, Jesus was a Jewish boy growing up mm -hmm. with the typical Jewish religion, and so we know from the early, uh, the early books and early Jewish uh, literature, we know exactly what the Jewish boys would have been doing. Mm -hmm. And so at the age of three, a Jewish boy would have been memorizing the book of Psalms mm -hmm. as his father would have sang the book of songs to him. Right. By the age of five, he would have been committing to memory the book of Leviticus mm -hmm. as his father would have been teaching him that. At the age of 10, most Jewish boys would even have the, old, uh, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, mm -hmm. committed to memory. Mm -hmm. By the age of 13, a Jewish boy comes into manhood mm -hmm. and most Jewish boys had the Old Testament committed to memory. Right. And we're already moving on to study the Mishnah, mm -hmm. which was an oral law that was handed down from generation to generation from the time of Moses until it was compiled in Tiberias right. in the second century. By the age of 18, a Jewish boy would be pursuing his vocation. And age of 20, the same thing. Jesus was a carpenter, right? Or a stonemason, right. right? That's right. And then at the age of 30, get this one, the Jewish people believe that a Jewish male came into his full vigor mm -hmm. and only then was he ready for his public ministry. Right. So at the age of 30, Jesus comes into his public ministry. 
Remember in the first the first miracle when he's turning the water into wine, right. and his mother comes to him and says, "Hey, we're out of wine," and he says, "Woman, my time has not yet come." Uh -huh. He wasn't 30 yet, right. but he did the miracle anyways. But at the age of 30, he comes onto the scene in his public ministry, and he has three years uh -huh. to change the world. Three years. I think it's interesting because it's like approximately 65,000 thoughts go through our mind a day. Yeah. He didn't have a second, a moment that wouldn't count for the kingdom. He was a kingdom person mm -hmm. at all times. And that's the essence of the Beatitudes, attitudes for kingdom people to be in. And that's what that means, attitudes mm -hmm. for kingdom people. And, so, and basically this ministry happened mostly right here where we are. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Nazareth was not that far from here, half hour by car. And then he appeared here and this is where so many of the stories unfold. That's right, this is where they unfold. And then you have to understand that when Jesus was teaching, he taught in a way that was typical to rabbis called um, remez. What is remez? It means alluding to. Right. So if we've already established that Jewish men during the time of Jesus had scripture committed to memory, all a rabbi would have to do is a wor say a word, a key, a phrase, and all of a sudden an entire passage would explode in the listener's mind and you would know exactly what he was pointing back to in scripture. So Mussolini had this place built when? In 1927. Now what gave him the land rights to be able to do this? Well, different churches came in and purchased land and ordered the erection of churches on the original, uh, many or on the original sites where Helena had designated. In this particular case, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so they built it in 1927 and an architect by the name of Antonio Barlucci mm -hmm. built it. Yeah, this obviously is a very popular spot for people to show up and visit. You can see a lot of activity around us. People come from all over the yeah. world. They have that one time where they want to make a pilgrimage and see where scripture took place. Yeah, yeah, amazing. <laughs> prophets walked and, and the miracles took place. Yeah. Well, that was quite an experience, right? Between the garden tomb, Tisha Michelle, and the Mount of Beatitudes, a lot there. The scope of what we cover in Christ Revealed is really breathtaking, and I'm so excited that you're here with me and we can go on this journey together. Thanks for tuning in. That completes episode one of Christ Revealed. Such a joy to be with you. Please remember, help us in our mission to get this information out into the world. God knows the world needs this type of inspiration right now. So share this with everyone you know. Also, of course, you can own Christ Revealed if you want to investigate that. There's information here for you to check that out. I am so excited that we just got through the first episode and I look forward to being with you in episode two of Christ Revealed. Music